Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and there are so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about the state of Israel and the nature of life in the Middle East. But there are those on the Israeli scene who open windows of understanding for American Jews who care about the future of the Jewish state. No one is more illuminating, thoughtful, eloquent, than my very special guest on this edition of L'Chaim. I hope you know him well, Yishai Fleischer, the international spokesperson for the Jewish community of Hebron. And Yishai Fleischer is also an Israeli broadcaster, a columnist for major news websites. And the New York Times published his op-ed piece entitled, A Settler's View of Israel's Future. By the way, if you haven't met Yeshai before on other editions of the Chaim, let me briefly summarize some of the highlights of Yeshai Fleischer's remarkable story. He was born in Haifa. His parents were Refusnik scientists who made Aliyah in the 1970s. And due to his father's work, the family moved to New Jersey when Yeshai was eight years old. And that's where he lived and went to high school. When Yeshai was 17, he returned to Israel to become a lone soldier in the IDF, serving in southern Lebanon, where he was seriously injured by a Hezbollah roadside bomb. But Yishai survived, and after recovery, he returned to the United States for college, earning a degree in political science from Yeshiva University and a degree in international law from Cardoza Law School. And now Yishai Fletcher uses all of his learning experience, talent, and his love of Israel to help us understand more about the realities of life in Israel and to raise questions and suggest some answers that are often not part of the American Jewish discourse. And I should also mention one of the people I've met through JBS who's become very special to me is Ishai Fleischer. It is wonderful having you. Thank you for joining us again, my dear friend. How are you? It's good to see you, Mark, and congratulations on these new studios. Thank you very, very much. It's good to see that JBS is, uh, continues to grow and move it's forward. It's great. And the audience is wonderful. We are now almost at 50 million American television homes globally online, so that's who's watching you on this edition of L'Chaim. Well, you're, you're being a light onto the nations through this uh, mechanism, through this channel, and it's really bringing the light of the Jewish people, the Torah, and of Israel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And you've helped me do that from the very beginning. So everybody understands, you represent the settler community uh, within the American Jewish community in general, certainly within the liberal f streams of the Jewish community. The whole idea of West Bank and Judea Samaria is troubling to many who believe in some way Israel is perpetuating a problem. There's occupation, there's brutalizing of the Palestinian communities. And here you are a representative of that. And as long as you've been appearing on L'Chaim, you have been in that perspective. How have you found American Jews relating to you as someone who represents the settler community, and not just the settler community, you are an outspoken, you are articulate in defending settler rights, and you're in Hebron, which is one of the, I mean, there's a Jewish community there. Most people have never been there. There's a major Arab city, but contiguous is the older Jewish section of Hebron. Right. There's a wall that separates you, in essence, a fence, and no Jew, at least when I was there and to my knowledge still today, no Jew is allowed into the Arab city of Hebron. This is what you represent. I want to know how American Jews with whom you interact, how do they react to you and 
How do they hear your message? Well, first thing, past that conflict picture that you drew, which is true, 100% correct, but past that there's something deeper, more foundational, which is at the root of it all, which is in Hebron lie the tombs of the forefathers and mothers. This whole channel, JBS, and everything that you've done, everything, all your whole career, is all based on the fact that you're Jewish, and being Jewish is a peoplehood as well as a religion, and that peoplehood is founded by Abraham and Sarah, and they're buried in Hebron. Like our, the roots of our whole thing, the whole shtick, the whole story of the Jewish people is rooted in Hebron, and therefore it's a core part of our identity. And we have about 700,000 visitors a year that come to Hebron, specifically to connect with the forefathers and mothers, mostly Jews, but many, many non-Jews. So that's the, I mean, say I present myself first and foremost past the conflict or before the conflict in this core issue. And people want to connect on that level, one way or another. With regarding to American Jewry, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of changes. First thing, there's a big difference between the Orthodox world and the so-called liberal world or the reformed conser conservative world um, in that the Orthodox tend to, to be more on the right, on the conservative side, on the, on, you know, let's call it nationalistic, however you want to uh, frame it. Uh, and the rest tend to be a little bit more on the left. That being said, so therefore, when I talk about Hebron to Orthodox people, they're, they're, they can accept it easily. And they think that we're right and we should be holding on. On the left, uh, there is more of a question mark, should we be there in the first place, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, post-Gaza, there is a change in the ether, the political kind of thinking. People are not so certain anymore that giving land for peace makes sense. And so therefore, our presence there is a little bit seen as, as a little bit more, they, they want to understand why we're there, and does it make sense to, to be there? Now, I want to tell you that I met with a very senior member of uh, the American administration, and, and uh, I showed him the map, and I said to him, Hebron, if the Jewish community wasn't in Hebron, and we'd pull out of there, then the army would pull out, that place would be the next Gaza, and it would be one hour drive from Jerusalem on the same ridge, and it would control the rest of the country. You're going to create the next Gaza. And people, people, uh, people are, are, are concerned about that. They're starting to understand that. Kind of, they kind of get it, that it doesn't make sense anymore, or, or at least are doubting the sense of the two-state solution. I saw that Bill de Blasio, Mayor de Blasio, tweeted out uh, a statement saying, you know, the two-state solution is the only way forward. But I, I, I said to him, would you create no-go zones here in New York City? Would you create ethnic Jewishly, ethnically cleansed regions here in New York City? Of course not. So why are you giving you know, that, that kind of advice to Israel? It doesn't make sense. And I think that my, my tweet towards him is, is a tweet that's sitting in people's brains. Like, does this really make sense? Mm -hmm. When you say you question the two-state solution, do you have an alternative? Well, I, you know, uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, uh, this is not the first time we've discussed right, we've discuss this. I was going to say. Uh, okay. But I want to know where your thinking is today. Um, I, I want to tell you the smart answer and the dumbed-down answer. <laughs> okay? The dumbed-down answer is very important. The dumbed-down answer is there are 22 Arab countries, 400 million Arabs. We have a relatively a matchbox on a football field as compared to their landmass, which is about 5 million square miles. We have about 10,000 square miles. We have one matchbox within their football field of land. They, in their world, the 400 million Arabs, are today quite given, sadly, to jihadism or various jihadist types of, of thinking. This land that we're talking about, uh, the land of Israel. The heart of it is the West Bank, which is also the high ground. It also abuts on the north and the south, Jerusalem. So the dumbed-down version is giving away our land to our enemies is dumb. Okay? The bottom line, the really simple solution is this is our land. We're going to hold on to it. There are minorities living amongst us. We have to give them decencies and rights as much as possible without endangering our security. But the land is ours on every level, on a historical, a legal, military level. This is our small land, and it's the high land. We're going to hold on to it, and we're going to give people decencies and rights, those who want to live in a Jewish state. Even though they're not Jewish, they could keep their Palestinian, Arab, Muslim identity. They could live amongst us if they live peacefully. And if they can't leave, live peacefully, they'll either fight with us, where we'll win, or they'll find self-determination somewhere else. Mm -hmm. 
That's the, that's the simple formula. Okay. And what's a, what about citizenship? Okay, so that now you're getting away from the simple thing and asking a more technical question about, about voting rights, for example, and, and all these issues. Fine. So, so, so there's various models that we've uh, tried to come what up with. What model do you like? There's two of them that I like. There's two. One, people always say to me, no, 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 but hear me out for a second. One is a very simple one, which is called Jordan is Palestine. And I'm not now talking about regime change or anything like that. I'm talking about giving the Palestinians back their citizenship in Jordan. It was taken away in 1988. Give them citizenship in, in Jordan, but stay in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank. Stay there, live there. You'll be residents of Israel. We'll take care of your life. But if you want to vote for your Palestinian state, that's in Jordan right next door. Okay? Who that's took one. their right to win in 1988? The King of Jordan. The King of Jordan. King Hussein took it away from them. And I say... This was not taken by Israel or... Absolutely not. Right. In one day, they woke up stateless, by the way, which is illegal under international law. And actually, the country that took away your state, your, your citizenship, is the one okay. that's... That's if, one. Okay. Just, uh, we'll come up to number two in a second. If Peter Beinert were here, he would say to you, giving people, uh, saying you're going to be nice to people who live under your control and not giving them the right to vote is not, is not acceptable. It's a begins to feel like apartheidism, and it's not anywhere in, the, in the, the way in which the founding fathers of the state of Israel and the Jewish people as a whole conceived of a Jewish state which was going to be democratic. And therefore, your first solution, if you stay here, we'll be nice to them, we'll take care of them. Not only is it, does it sound paternalistic and patronizing, Peter Beinart said the Jewish community would say, it's fundamentally an abrogation of the mandate of the Jewish state. What would you say to a Peter Beinart? I would say two things to him. Uh, God bless Peter. Uh, I'm familiar with his work. And, and you know, I'm on the other side of uh, you know, his arguments often. Uh, first thing I would say to him, Peter, um, democracy is much more fungible than you think. And let's just take a look at this great country, America. We have here a whole island called Puerto Rico, two million people. They get a right to vote for congressmen, but those congressmen don't have a vote in Congress. They don't have a vote. Uh, they, get, they don't get to vote for the President of the United States. So one of two things, Peter. Either fix your problem in America and leave me alone, or accept the fact that there's different, there's different things that can happen in a democracy when you have territories or different situations or, 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 or defensive uh, interests. So that's number one. Um, Number two is that I would fundamentally disagree with his assertion in, in your mouth uh, of what Israel is supposed to be. There's a, there are two concepts, Jewish and democratic. Jewish is an ethnic national designation. Mm -hmm. Democratic is exactly not. Jewish comes from the word Yehuda or Yehudi. It comes from the word Judea or Judah. It's a Jewish name. And democratic is a Greek name. Okay? Now, these two things cannot be co-equal values. They cannot be co-equal. And the Peter Beinerts of this world think that Jewish and democratic means democratic first, and then Jewish. It's democratic because the virtue of the fact there's a lot of Jews. And then it, you know, it's Jewish because of that. I say no. It's Jewish first. It's an ethnic national state designed to defend our persecuted minority in this region. That's its first and foremost goal. And it's supposed to help defend our people, every hair on a Jewish kid's head, and it's supposed to help our culture flourish. The rights of Arabs in Israel, this, sound, this is going to sound a little shocking, are wonderful, are great, are beautiful, are incidental to the raison d'etre of the Jewish state. Incidental. They are not the first and foremost goal of the Jewish people. Nobody came out of the Holocaust saying, oh my God, thank God I came out of Auschwitz. Now can I establish a democracy for the Arabs? That's not what happened at all. Moreover, we are surrounded by ethnic national states. We are not some kind of Western plug-in. We're a Semitic, Middle Eastern, ethnic national state. We're not that different than the Arabs. We have the same genetic code. We have the same, a similar genetic code, similar language, similar religion. We're from that region, not from this region. And therefore, that country has to, Israel has to operate within the rules of that region, which are ethnic national states that defend their interests. Arabs, Arabs that accept Israel will live and have great opportunities. Uh, but this is not their state. If they would like their state, they have 22 states to choose from. If they would like to live in Israel, which is their Semitic cousins, wonderful. 
And that also, all that, all that denies the fact that there's a deep jihadism. Okay, we have Arab parties today in the Israeli Knesset, and yet they vote pretty much in an anti-Israel fashion. Okay, so we have a problem. And, and, and talking about giving them more rights instead of talking about defending more of our peoplehood is, I think, a, a, flawed, uh, a flawed outlook into what's going on today. We are going to get to your second answer. Your first answer is there's Jordan. Sure. But I want to finish this thought. What you hear people say is this is what is alienating an entire generation of young American Jews who feel, who don't understand a thing you just said. Right. By the way, I, say, I think you say it beautifully. I would love Israel to be as democratic as it can be, but it's not democratic first. Yep. What I want most of all is the state of Israel to fulfill its mission of being a Jewish state. Correct. And when it was founded, by the way, everybody understood that. Right. Everyone. And Ben-Gurion said to the Arabs living there, and they weren't Palestinians. They are Arabs living there. Stay, and you will have citizenship. And the Jewish, every now and then you'll hear somebody say, I, I want Israel to live by Jewish values. Well, the Ger Toshav is a Jewish value. A Ger Toshav is the non-resident alien, a non-citizen who comes in and lives with you in peace. Right. Israel has no responsibility to somebody who wants to kill the state of Israel. That becomes a rodef. And the rodef is a pursuer to kill you, and Jewish values, Jewish law demands, doesn't suggest, demands that you protect yourself, even if it means taking the life of the rodef, of the pursuer. Right. And so the reality for me is Israel has been remarkable in the way it has embraced and allowed Arab culture and Arab life to flourish so that you've had, Israel has had a Supreme Court, more than one, Supreme Court Justice right. of the State of Israel is an Arab Israeli. That's unbelievable. That's, right. That's not what American Jews, especially younger American Jews, hear from their Jewish leadership or understand instinctively. Right. What young American Jews hear and feel is that Israel's obligation, Jewishly, Yeshai, their Jewish obligation as a Jewish state is to be fully democratic in that it does not deny any non-Jew, Arab, Christian, whatever, Christian Arabs as well. But they, you, we are not to deny any non-Jew, any social, civic, political, educational, health, right, which includes... But what about national? No, no, not national. Right. But if they want to be an Israeli national, they have the right from the Jewish perspective, is what you'll hear here in America, of being a citizen. Right. What's wrong with that? Uh, nothing would be wrong with that at all. It would be great. Let's say for, we have the Druze, and the Druze are about 40,000 uh, uh, of these non-Jewish folks living in Israel. And they are Arab-speaking, and they are genetically Arab, but they have a different, they're running a different software. The software that they run is called loyalty. They are a loyal group of people who know, they're different, but they serve in our army at the top ranks. They, our, their Knesset members are fabulous, Zionistic, even though they're Druze. Uh, why? Because they just believe that there's a sovereign, they respect it, they're loyal to it. Now, uh, Israeli Arabs and Palestinian Arabs, some of them, and not a few of them, run a different software. That software, very broadly speaking, is called jihadism, which is not accepting. It's intolerant of the Jewish state because it bothers their religious sensibilities. It bothers them that there's a Jewish entity or sovereign in their Muslim lands. So they just run a different way of thinking. If, 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 uh, if the Arabs would, would go into uh, that kind of mindset, loyalty, we, we would have a secession of conflict in a second, and indeed they would be citizens. Um, so we have no problem with that. I have no ethnic issue with them. I don't, I don't, I'm not some kind of racist against Arabs. I've got no issue with them whatsoever. I like their culture. I like having it around. I, I'm, I'm part of it. I, I feel it. It's part, it's, part of my, it's part of my thing. It's part of the Middle East thing. But, but like, if, if it, what, what we all know and we all sense it naturally is that they're trying to be enemies not accept us loyal, with loyalty. There's more to say about this, 
but I don't want to lose the whole thread. I said to you, what's your alternative to a two-state solution? You said there are two. Right. One is this, this notion that Jordan, somehow Jordanian citizenship would solve the problem. What's number two? Number two is more straightforward, which is we're going to annex. Oh, by the way, I have to tell you a piece of news. We're going to annex Judea and Samaria. It's going to happen. It'll happen now. It'll happen later. We're going to do it. It's just historically accurate. It's, it's geographically accurate. It's, it's militarily accurate. So we're going to one. Why do you say that? Because what do, you, what do we, you know? I know how tenacious we are. And I know that we are more tenacious than the other people. We're going to hold on to this land. And also, I just understand the power of common sense. I just understand how powerful common sense is. Do the Israeli people want to annex the West Bank? Yes. There was an article recently uh, about 29 out of 30 Likud members have made statements of annexation or sovereignty for the West Bank. We, we have now seen that the annexation of Jerusalem and the annexation of the Golan Heights in 1982 have paid off with the recognition of the United States uh, of America. We have a lot of Arabs living in the so-called West Bank, but we're going to annex those areas. We're going to figure out how to deal with those folks and how to give them decencies and rights without endangering our country. We're going to hold on to this land. That's what's going to happen. And we settlers, quote unquote, have a tremendous uh, support, political support. We've, Hebron recently had an event at the Knesset. All the ministers were there. The, right now we have, what, uh, 62 Knesset, Knesset members to the right. We're going to have in this coming election 64, maybe 66. It's moving in that direction. When it comes to the issue, by the way, I, I want to make one thing clear. I'm not talking about, when I say right wing or conservative, I don't mean conservative economics. I'm not talking about abortion. I'm not talking about all these other issues. I'm talking about holding on to this land. And I can see that Israel's swinging, and I'm going to do my darnest to make sure Israel swings uh, more to, towards annexation. On the American Jewish scene, that's a very scary idea. Whether you and I like it or not, it's a very scary idea. And what I keep hearing all the time is people saying to me, what Israel is doing is driving a wedge between American Jews, the vast majority of which are either liberal, they're liberal politically, and they're secular in terms of Judaism. So your secular Jews, especially the young Jews on college campus, who are not only exposed to BDS and SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, but every professor they seem to have these days is very oh, they're critical of Israel, obnoxious, that the, the kind of philosophy you are articulating is only going to make that problem more severe, mm -hmm. and you're going to lose mm -hmm. American Jewish support. OK, a few things, Mark, because this is the big issue. And really, this is the big issue that we have to discuss here Correct. at this channel. Right. 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 This, this is the issue on the table. Absolutely. It's much bigger than the issue of what we're really going to do at the end politically in Israel. Absolutely. Right. Today, somehow, American Jewry has got this sense that you're talking about that they know better than the Israeli electorate what's good and bad for it. And why? Why did that, that happen? Not because of our policies, but because there's people who want to drive a wedge. It's because there's been education, an effort to educate and to teach that our country is some kind of a liberal country. The Peter Beinerts in this world, I would sue them. I would sue them for, 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 for what they've done to the Jewish people. They create an atmosphere where American Jewry looks down at Israeli Jewry and says, how come you're doing this elite, these liberal practices? I blame him for, for creating such an atmosphere. Why don't you just teach what we used to teach at APAC, what we used to teach in this generation that you speak about, which is we're going to support our brothers in Israel. We're going to support them for what, what they're doing out there. They surely know how to defend themselves and what needs to be done. And Israeli Jewry has to say, hey, I might not be on the same page with American Jewry, but we're with them. They're our brothers. That's what I do. Okay, I come here holding hands across the Atlantic, trying to explain our position over there, trying to bring Jews to connect, to understand each other better. I'm not here to judge American Jewry. I'm not here to talk about American Jewry's uh, various positions on things. I'm, I don't, I'm not here to tell them how to run their affairs here, because I know that they have a very different life consciousness, okay? And, and the same thing f w with Israel. Now, with regarding to young people, it really depends. I have never seen a period where you, you speak to any group of soldiers, there's two to three out of any, like, 20 groups of soldiers, two to three Americans who are lone soldiers. It's like a phenomenon, okay? And they're strong, and they believe in it. Young Jewish people, if they're, if they're taught that Israel is a bad country, and there are many elements that want to teach that, that it's a bad country and a liberal country, et cetera, then they'll start to buy it. But if you, teach, if you teach people, that's a tough country. 
I have to use a, an improper word here on your show, a badass country, okay, that, that is holding on to, to, to its land, and we should be proud of that, and it's pushing back on the bad guys and creating an amazing life for, for uh, opportunities for people who want to choose it, and there's really a light over there. Uh, if, if that was sold to young American Jews, they would buy it. And just so the audience understands, who are the bad guys? The bad guys are the jihadists, not the Arabs, the jihadists, uh, who are bad to the Copts, the Yazidis, the Christians, the Kurds. They're bad to, any fo they're bad to one another. They're a suppressive lot who basically are intolerant, um, who are intolerant of the Jewish presence in the Middle East. And they're very, very, very intolerant to their own Arabs who think they're friendly. I have, uh, let me just tell you one story. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a, an Arab sheikh who was what I call a shtickel terrorist. He was a, he, he a small-time terrorist, okay? And he went to Israeli jail. His name is Muhammad Jaber. He went to Israeli jail. And when he was in jail, he started realizing that Israel treats him very kindly, very decently. And he started seeing what's really going on. And for the first time, he actually came in contact with Israelis, in jail, his jailers. And he became impressed with them. And he started speaking more pro-Israel and started changing his, his outlook. He, later on, when he came out of jail, he came on Israeli news, started talking about that. Then uh, Rabbi Yehuda Glick went to his house in Hebron and took a picture with him during the Ramadan uh, past the fast, the, the breaking bread meal, and they took a picture together. Well, the next day, he was invited to the Palestinian Authority for a little interview. Little did he know that he was going to be arrested. He was arrested and tortured for 40 days in the prison in Jericho. Now, I and, my, and people at Hebron, we reached out to the American ambassador. We reached out, reached out to the Palestinian representatives. We just tried to get Muhammad Jabir out of jail and out of this torture because, because he's a good person and because he was talking with, with normal positivity, positivity towards Israel. We weren't able to do it. Guess what? Muhammad Jabir cannot, does not accept any of my groups anymore. I can't talk to him anymore. He's scared. He walks around with a limp, okay, because he's been worked over. There are folks that want everything but normalization. They want war with Israel forever. It's lucrative. The Europeans will give them money. They, they take pride in the fact that they're part of the jihad. Uh, and those are the bad guys, and they're supporters. Now, then there is a soft layer uh, that maybe even comes from ig ignorance or from a good heart. And Peter Beinert's amongst them. It's a soft layer that really helps create this illusion, a, a, a liberal veneer in front of the jihad, as though Israel is really bad for being in Hebron where we've been for 3,500 years, as though Israel is the abusing country, as though, for example, UNESCO came out and said that the Tomb of the Fathers and Mothers is actually a Palestinian World Heritage Site. Well, I call them, I call them the legitimate wing of the jihad, okay? Because what they do is that they justified the war against us by claiming that we're occupiers, and therefore the war against us is a war of liberation. And we're some kind of white interloper instead of what we really are, which is an indigenous people living on this land. And the war against us is an unjust war that's based on ideology, religious ideology, which is jihad. Okay? So framing is everything. And, and the, the Peter Beinerts of this world, God bless him, he's a good person. I know he's got a good heart. He's a smart guy. Uh, but at the end, he is part of the unteaching of American Jewry's love for Israel. And he's res people like him are responsible for driving a wedge. The bottom line for those who support BDS, seriously support BDS, and who sometimes somehow see SJP as part of the struggle for liberation, they really believe the Jews stole the Palestinians' land. Right. And if you say to them, you know, Jews go back three, four, five, they won't disagree. What they'll say is, yes, but history moves on. And the reality is that for whatever tragic reason, the Jews were exiled, they were thrown out. There was a small little piece of Jews who stayed, but the vast majority of Jews became Jews of the diaspora. And it's true, they were thrown out here and they were thrown out there. And the way Zionism and, is, and the quest to return to Eretz Yisrael precedes the Shoah precedes the Holocaust. Sure. The Holocaust just made it more evident why the Jew could not find a home anywhere because every Western nation was asked, would you be able to save Jews for us? And they all said no. Virtually all said no. But it's still, the argument goes, that while you have an ancient past, 
there are Palestinians who have just as ancient a past as you do. They have different names, but their families are living there. Their great 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 <coughs> grand that's their great 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 grandfather's olive tree. And they developed the land and they were working the land. They weren't bothering anybody. They were very often tenant farmers with absentee landlords. And the Jews came in and bought the bought land from absentee landlords, and all of a sudden this Palestinian farmer who had no idea what was going on was told he didn't have the right to that land. And then in the end, the Jew came in and, yes, he, he took care of some swamps, and yes, he made a desert bloom, but at the same time, he took homes where the Arab says, you see this key? This key used to open that house in Jaffa, and I can't go there anymore because there's a Jew who has that land. And the young American Jew and the young Americans right now who are caught up in BDS on college campuses, they are convinced that what Israel's real crime is, the way Ari Shavit wrote about it in My Promised Land. Right. We stole land and we destroyed a people in the process. Right. And, the re and what they really, really want is all the Jews turn out the lights, get on a plane, close the country down, and until that happens, they won't be. What they really want is the elimination of the Jewish state right. of Israel. Right. And you respond. Okay, for those folks who have problems with Israel being founded, you know, why don't you go deal with the whole American Indian issue, how this country was founded, if you're so morally that's high. The, Bowie, I that's just, the wrong answer. I, it's not, you know what, you know what, it's not the right answer but it is an important thing to say, before you get too much on the high horse, don't have so much hypocrisy. That's number one. Number two, there really was never an Arab presence. The way you described it, there's even more, it, it's even more radical towards the other way. Arabs came in in 637 to, to the land of Israel, kicked out in 1199, came back again in 1267 under the Mamluks, subsumed under the Ottomans in 1517, got out of there, were kicked out of there, the Ottomans in, in 1917. The, the world split up the Ottoman Empire. The world recognized that this land, the small parcel of the land in the Arab world, belonged to the Jewish people, that we had a superior claim to it, a superior claim. The world got together in the 20s, the early 20s, and the middle 20s, recognized that fact. Okay, we came into a land that even Mark Twain described as empty. Empty. At 1850, we're a majority already. Okay, they never even had any kind of, there's no Palestinian sovereign sovereignty. There's no... Everything that you described is correct, but the point is, is that even if you had your olive tree in your house, you're not a sovereign there. You're just living there. That's okay. And I want you to keep living there. I want you to keep living there. I have no problem with you living there. But we're the sovereigns now, and we're, we're a good sovereign. Not that that's the justification. I could be a bad sovereign and have every right to it, but I, I happen to be the, the just sovereign, and I'm also a kind sovereign. And we have every right to this, to, to, to this homeland. We've also won it in defensive wars, which is international law principle. I don't know if there's many countries except for the ones like China that never stopped existing on a land. I'm not sure there are so many countries that have as much justification to exist as, as, as Israel does. And the fact is, Mark, you have now brought two Jews, Beinart and Shavit, uh, as teachers or unteachers. Uh, of the Zionist narrative, the creation of a Palestinian narrative to replace it. It's a new kind of replacement theology. I call it replacement narrative. It's pernicious. It's working. Uh, and my job is to help teach people the history of the Jewish people, the connection, and our rights, our superior rights, and, and show them a way forward th through that. Good for you. What's the second alternative that I haven't let you tell us? Right. There's a question. You're not for the two-state solution. You had two answers. One was Jordan. The second answer is? The second answer is maybe more straightforward. Where I got stuck before, as I said, we're going to next Judea and Samaria. Yes. That's a piece of news. <laughs> so, so we're going to next Judea and Samaria. And then we're going to give the Arabs that live in Judea and Samaria uh, residency. When I say that, I mean minus the jihadists, minus those who want to fight with us. What we're, are you going to do with the jihadists? Huh? What are you going to do with the jihadists? They'll be fought. They'll be fought. They'll be jailed. They'll be killed. They'll be exiled. They'll be, they'll be fought. The way you fight folks, okay? Uh, we'll fight the jihadists. The, the decent folks, which is the majority, will get residency. And here, it depends on who I'm speaking with, but I could see it in a few different ways. But the simple version is residency with a pathway to citizenship for folks who prove loyalty, like the Druze. It's just that simple. If you're, if you're with the Jewish state, you, you, you love it, you respect it, you accept it, fine. 
you know, swear an oath of loyalty. That doesn't mean that we take away your, your Muslim, uh, Palestinian, or, or Arab identity. Keep it. But, but you are now, just like, a, just like a Chinese person living in Chinatown, you keep your whole identity, but, but you're an American. I think it's doable. It also depends who's going to be in the next American administration. That's a big question. In what way? Well, you know, we have an administration. Right, right, right now there's a political earthquake happening with, is Netanyahu going to be the next prime minister? Is Trump going to be the next president? This is obviously a, a team that works together. That's obvious to everybody. And this team um, has some street credibility in the Middle East. Uh, and so if this team continues to work together, yes, there's a good chance of that. If the, the same the same American administration that accepted the Golan Heights in Jerusalem is probably the same administration that would accept Judea and Samaria, and Israel would become the big boy in the block protecting, being the NATO, the regional NATO. That's, I think that that could be. If you have a, a democratic uh, president in Israel and maybe a center-left government in Israel, then it probably won't go that way and we'll go back towards two-state solutionism. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu seems, on the one hand, to still be a very attractive candidate to most Israelis who sort of feel well, like many American Jews feel about Trump. They don't like him. He seems to be involved now in scandal, and maybe even e illegalities. What do you expect to happen here? With, and Gantz and the blue and white party with Lapid seem to have some traction. What's your sense of what's going to happen on April 9th? I am hoping, and, that, and my sense is, that the country is going to continue to lean to the right. And our, concerned, our concern in, in, in my circles is really the coalition. Is it a right-wing coalition, a conservative coalition, or is it a left-wing coalition? That's really the, the main concern. Uh, Netanyahu, he's been, in many ways, a great leader. I think he'll go down as one of Israel's greatest leaders, certainly in two realms, economics, and diplomacy. Those are his golden, you know, golden touch. Really, golden touch. Um, and I don't know if Israel has ever had anybody like him. Uh, in one realm, it's well known in Israel that he's a little bit weaker, and that's the realm of defense. He's not a big warrior. He's not a big fighter. That's just not his thing. He gets a little reticent to, to smash. That's just not his thing. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, but some people think that he's allowed too much of our enemies to be built up. On the other hand, he has, and I, I go the other way, he has fought the Iranian incursion into, into Syria. Um, I think Israelis, on the one hand, would like to see the next prime minister. They'd like to see the next guy, because it's time. He's been a prime minister for, for as long as Ben Gurion. It's, it's time longer. for- Longer. Longer, it's, it's, time for, it's time for some new blood. And you know, uh, Jewish leaders have a hard time giving up their seats, they don't walk off the, the stage very easily. That's just the way our people do it. Uh, and, um, but at the same time, they don't see somebody better right now. And again, there's a lock with the Trump administration. That's not a small thing. There's a kind of triumvirate today in the world. Some people find it very distasteful, but the, the triumvirate is Trump, Netanyahu, and in the East, Putin. And there's this thing happening, these kind of strong men, like it or not like it, uh, but vis-a-vis -vis Israel, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a triumvirate that works. And, uh, How is Putin part Putin of this? Putin is the most not anti-Israel Russian prime minister, Russian dic di di you know, uh, dictator, dictator, yeah, dictator, or whatever you want to call him. Czar, really, he's a czar, right? Uh, and uh, he basically is, uh, uh, it's, it's actually a personality thing. He is not anti-Jewish, anti-Israel. Uh, are, as are many Russian uh, czars. He's not anti-Semitic? No, seemingly not. Seemingly not. Seemingly that he, he is more, and he's able to swallow Israel's attacks in Syria, which is a Russian sphere place, and is also keeping the Iranians somewhat at bay. Uh, let's not overstate. I'm not saying it's a love affair with Putin. I'm, I'm far from saying that. But there's a, a detente that, that exists there, and that's important. And Israel is more robust today uh, in our region. Uh, so I think that Netanyahu will probably take, take it. I'm, my, my prediction is probably Netanyahu will take it, uh, the prime ministership. But at some point in the year or two, we'll leave the scene for one reason or another. And a new, probably somebody from Likud, will rise up. There's Gidon Saar. 
There's Ayelet Shaked. She's a, you know, a candidate. Do Israelis like Ayelet Shaked? Yes. yes. She's something. quite a person. She's quite a person. She's incredibly intelligent. And she's, she's very Israeli. She's got Israeli feminine strength. She's a mom, but super, super intelligent, has, has shown guts to take on the Supreme Court, some of the establishment institutions in Israel. She's a candidate. And there are others. There's Yuli Edelstein. There's others. There's, there, there, are, there are contenders, okay. smart people. You didn't, however, mention anyone from labor or blue and white or merits. Anybody there who captures the imagination of the Israeli people from the left? Yes. I, th I, think, I think that Benny Gantz um, is, is a fresh face. And I think that he, you know, he's tall. He's, he's got you know, beautiful blue eyes. He was the, the chief of staff, head of the army. And I think that there's, and I think together with Yair Lapid, Yair Lapid is, I think, a Zionist, uh, I think a good looking guy, a great presenter, uh, somebody who, who comes off as, as wanting the good of the country. Uh, so I think that there's, there's interest there. I think there's interest there. And it's the new Labor Party. Uh, it's not, it's, the Labor Party has gotten more left, and they're really more center. And I think that they're going to do very well this election. I'm guessing they're going to sit in opposition unless they form a government with Elikud, which also could happen, like a kind of... Uh, Unity government? A, a, well, yeah, not a... They'll yeah, call it that. Yes, yeah, a, a center-left, center-right government. That could certainly happen. Do not take that off the table. That could happen in, in the near future. Although, I don't see it. That's not what I think the cards are, are bringing, but it, it, could, it could be in the offing. Okay. Every time we talk about elections... American Jews express their enormous disappointment in the way the electoral system gives the small Orthodox parties a, an amount of power, a disproportionate amount of power, and how at the moment the chief rabbinate and the ultra-Orthodox control Jewish life in the state of Israel. It controls <coughs> who is a Jew, how you become a Jew, how you marry, and how you're buried. And it even affects the way people who consider themselves strong Israeli Jews, the Jews from the former Soviet Union, the Jews from Ethiopia. It always questions their legitimacy and often asks them to jump through hoops, even at times to be converted again before they can be buried in a Jewish cemetery if they were killed and by the end serving in the IDF. So for American Jews, this is a big deal, the lack of what American Jews call Jewish pluralism in Israel, symbolized by, and unfortunately too many American Jews don't understand it's only a symbol, but symbolized by the collapse of the Western Wall compromise where there was going to be a legitimate third section of the wall by Robinson's Arch, and at the last moment, the deal that Natan Sharansky had worked out was jettisoned, and Netanyahu did not make an issue of it. He didn't want to bring down his government over this issue. And there are many American Jews who just were irate. I'm now talking about non-Orthodox American Jews. Irate. And they threatened to withhold money, big money. They threatened to withhold political influence in Washington for the state of Israel because they now felt Israel had turned their back on them and was not embracing them as this concept. We are one people, and although it is a state of Israel, and there are citizens of the state of Israel, and Israelis are the ones who put their lives on the line, and more so, their children's lives on the line, when it comes to the religious Jewish personification of Israel, there was a feeling that all world Jewry should have a say in how that aspect of Israeli life, just that aspect, is dealt with. And I want to know your philosophy there. To what extent does it bother you, the Orthodox establishment and the power they have? And how do you react to the American Jewish response that says, you don't really love me if I can't become married by the rabbi that I want and I can't pray at some piece of the Western Wall et cetera, et cetera. Forget reform conservative control over part of the Western Wall, or orthodox control over part of the Western Wall. There are three sections there. Men's, women's, mixed. Do whatever you want. I myself want a mixed part of the wall. Why? Because I want to be able to take my daughter there. It's just very simple. Today, there is men's, women's, mixed. 
And the mixed section, the, 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 the art, Robertson's art section, is one of the most beautiful ones. Anyway, the point is the Western Wall, the options are there. Also, by the way, this infatuation with the Western Wall is, is, uh, is, uh, is, needs to be rectified. One of the great things that I've um, seen here in America is that whenever I ask any synagogue, any temple, including conservative reform, uh, I say to them, is, is the Western Wall the holiest place for the Jewish people? And everybody says to me, no. Everybody. That's been a big change. Everybody knows that the Temple Mount uh, is where two temples stood and that we pray that one day another temple, will, a third temple will stand there again. Uh, that's number one. Number two, with regarding to your uh, question about the ultra-Orthodox control, ultra -orthodox control of uh, Jewish life, uh, first thing I have to say is just that's not my issue. I don't live and breathe that issue. However, it is true that even on the right, there are many people who feel that. For example, there's a new political party called Zehut, the Identity Party, Moshe Feiglin. He's calling for separation of, uh, of church and state in Israel in general. In the Likud, you have people like Sharon Haskell, a fabulous young uh, Knesset member, and she's the liberal end. She might be right-wing on security issues, but she also wants to see uh, more pluralistic values inside those systems. Moreover, there are many organizations, including orthodox ones, uh, religious Zionist ones, modern orthodox ones, that want to see better treatment of people who want to get married through the rabbinate. And they've formed in order to give an alternative. There's all kinds of private organizations that are working to make people feel more normal and to kind of skirt the antiquated ultra-Orthodox systems that they have going on in the, in the marital world. One of the other things that bothers many American Jews was Netanyahu is reaching out to a party that's seen mm -hmm. as the inheritor of Kach, of Mayor Kahana. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a party that, well, some of the people who are running have very upsetting backgrounds. Mm -hmm. they, they were imprisoned. You're talking about the Jewish strength or Jewish Otsma party? Yes. The, the, the so-called Kahana party. What's your sense of that? In our environment where Jews are being murdered, for example, Ori Ansbacher, who this, this, this beautiful girl from Tekoa who was writing on a journal in the forest and an Arab came and, and raped and murdered her in, in a horrific fashion. We live in an environment where there's jihadism and hate all around us. It's not surprising that you're going to have an ultra-nationalist party rise up. I looked in Europe. There are many ultra-nationalist parties from Austria to, to, uh, to Holland to, to, to just in general, it's a, it's a common phenomenon. We have an ultra-nationalist party. The Supreme Court looked at the people who are running, and the Supreme Court got rid of one of the uh, people who, a former Knesset member, and, 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 and disqualified him from uh, Michael ben -Ari, Professor Michael ben -Ari, disqualified him from running. The rest have been deemed worthy to run under the laws against, uh, against racism and incitement. So there's, a, there's, an ele there's a, a one Knesset member left who is been cleared to run, and the people of Israel will vote for who they want to vote. And American Jewry should not be passing judgment on that. Say, well, our opinion is this, but let the Israelis vote on, the, on this person. And don't be so surprised in our atmosphere that there's going to be a party that says enough of kowtowing to the terrorism. Don't be so surprised. The expression is that they're disappointed that the Israeli people would want that party to be one of the parties that's running. And by the way, all I'm doing here is expressing what I've absolutely, heard. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it, it, my own feeling is, you know, Israel is large enough to permit Arab parties which preach the destruction of the state of Israel. They can be in the Knesset. I found it a little bit hypocritical that people said a, a Jewish party that was also extreme, although from the other side, has no right, right to be. And yet I understand people say you can't preach violence and you can't preach, preach the extent to which. The, there's no violence being preached by that party. They call for tougher measures against the jihad. Okay. Do you expect that party to get enough seats to win, a, enough votes to win a seat? Yes. Interesting. And I hope they do. You hope they do? I hope they do. Because? Because I think that their voice is important. I think it represents uh, a, a, a desperate need inside to say enough of this. Uh, like, for example, Ismail Haniya, the head of Hamas in Gaza, his office was hit. The next day, here he is standing, and his office is behind him, and he's doing a press conference. That guy should be hit. And somebody, and somebody should be able to say that. 
And I think that, that in fact that party says that. And I'm not ashamed of the fact that we have somebody in our, uh, in, in our, in our Israeli uh, representation of the Israeli people that cries give out, right? Cries like, oh my God, we have to do something about this. I think that's an important voice, a necessary voice. And I think that American Jewry, this is where American Jewry fails a little bit. It's like, it's like you, you, you're, you're so cold to, to, to the, the life reality of people being murdered. In the last few months, amazing people have been murdered, gunned down in a horrific fashion. So there's one party that says enough of this, and they're not legitimate. Uh, that to me, that 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 to me distances Israelis from American Jews. You're gonna get in my kishkas. You're gonna tell me that I can't have this party that's trying to defend us. Do you know the pain that people are suffering here? Do you do you do you know the reality? It's it, you know I would if I was APAC or if I was uh, you know American Jew, I would just say we support the Jewish people's right to elect their democratically elected leaders. Mm -hmm. That's it. I know the members of this party, by the way. I know them personally. Uh, are they bad them. people? They're amazingly righteous and good people, and they are strong in their beliefs. Against, and, and by the way, if you read their, uh, uh, their platform, it very specifically tries to separate between the issue of Arabs in general, which would be racism, and the haters, the jihadists, the organizations, the Hamas, that, that fight against us. Do they believe in forced deportation? No. Nobody believes in forced deportation today. What they believe in is maybe assisted uh, immigration for those people who want to leave voluntarily. By the, way, by the way, don't misunderstand me. Not everything that that party says or does do I like. Yes. I, I, I'm not necessarily a voter of that party. <laughs> right. I, I, don't, I don't stand for There is a few things there that they do which I don't like. And it's not my cup of tea. But so are many of the other parties. Yes. It's democracy. Yes. I, they're, they're, it's not meant to, I'm not meant to fall in love with everything that they stand for. So an Israeli said to me, you know, the supporters of that party, they have pictures on their wall of Baruch Goldstein. That's right. And that's what I was referring to. That is not something I'm comfortable with. Okay. Baruch Goldstein was, uh, was a man who 25 years ago was a doctor in the Jewish community of Hebron, my community, the one that I represent, who went into the tomb of the fathers and mothers, the tomb of the patriarchs, and shot up 25, uh, 29 Muslim worshippers, uh, killed them dead, and was himself killed in that incident. And some people revere him as a righteous man for doing that act, but we, the Jewish community, have unequivocally condemned and yes, continue to condemn absolutely, that act. Absolutely, absolutely. That's all there is to it. And there, and some of the members of that party, being on the ultra national side, have pictures of, of him uh, as a as a kind of hero. And I, I'm 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 uncomfortable with that. Okay. That's the bottom line. Uh, but there's another point that has to be made, which is, if you're not voting in Israel. It's hard to get a say. Israel is a very competitive political environment. And if you're not on the ground voting for somebody, you're going you're gonna, to, yeah, they're not going to be like, well, what do the American Jews think? It's not, it's not quite like that. But should Israeli Jewry care about what American Jews think? To some, ex to some large extent, to an to extent of, of love and recognizing that half of our brothers and sisters live, live abroad in America, yes, they should. But it's a small country, and its mind still kind of, uh, you, you know, fighting in the, in the muck for, 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 for control. Uh, and so they don't always have the leisure in their minds to think about who's across the ocean. Moreover, many Israelis don't really know America. Mm -hmm. They really don't know it, just like Americans don't know Israel. Yes, but Netanyahu knows. Yes. The leadership knows. Yes, but he also has to, in, 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 you said it, in, in the system that you have to accept uh, that you need the other parties. You know, and he's a politician, which means that he's going to give a little, take a little. And, uh, and, and one of the ways that he survives is that he makes everybody hate him. <laughs> and he works them one, uh, one against the other. Anyway, look, the bottom line is we've got to hold hands across the Atlantic. And I think American Jewry is making its voice heard. At the same time, except that it's a different sovereign country. And, and you have tremendous influence here and, and less influence there. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a balance. And I do want American Jewry to feel united, especially the young people. I think American Jewry can connect. They have to come. They have to visit. They have to see it for themselves. And they have to fall in love again. And, and this is, you know, this happens in every time I'm with you on a show. At some point, I just want to say, can we remember what a great time we're living in? Can we remember what a gift of a time we're living in? The greatest time in Jewish history in 2,000 years where we have a sovereignty in our land, the most exciting project of the Jewish people in 2,000 years, the building of a Jewish state. This is the big one. This is it. This is the big one. This is the one we've been waiting for, one way or another. And, it, and it's a marvelous time. And when you, when you forget 
just go to Jerusalem. Just go to the shuk, the, the, the bazaar on, on Fridays. See the, the, the pulsating life. When I was born, Mark, there were three million Jews in Israel. Now there are six and a half million Jews. The economy is flourishing. Our military is strong. We're, we're, the, the, the medicine is the best, some of the best in the world. It's just it's such an awesome and incredible time. And there are forces that want us to, to, they want us to take out only the dirty laundry, to put the dross out, to just show the negative sides. And, and they are, they are really, they're really lying to us because we're living in an amazing, amazing time. It's a, it's a great gift, and it's such an honor for me to be an Israeli, to carry a weapon, to, to live in Hebron, to, to be part of the story of Hebron. It's such an honor to be part of this, this great story from, from Hebron to Tel Aviv, from Hermon to Eilat, from, from high-tech to Torah learning. You know? it's, it's, this, it's this incredible light that's happening in our time. We have to always keep sight of that. While wanting to fix things and make things better, we have to keep sight of what we're talking about, this, this great, great moment. And, I, and I, it would be a shame if our, if our viewers today would get some kind of sense that, that it's all, you know, Jews are forgetting about it and American Jews are moving away. No, they're falling in love. How can you not? <laughs> you know, you're fabulous. <laughs> you know, it's same not quite. You are no, fabulous. No, 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 no. It's good to be And with I you. adore you. Again, you're one of the, the greatest presents I got <laughs> by doing JBS is to be your friend. And you say it so well. I, I want you, you know, if you lived in America, you'd have your own show here. I'd watch <laughs> on every single week. Kol Tu You Thank continue you, the everyone. wonderful work. And whenever you're here visiting the States, you have to sit in that chair. Okay? And I want to wish you continued strength and health and continued broadcasting. Thank you so much. Yishai Fleischer, the international spokesperson for the Jewish community of Hebron, a remarkable human being, a passionate Jew in Ohev Israel. And I just hope every now and then you get to hear him speak, especially if he's coming to your community. He can educate. He educates us about what Jewish life really is in the state of Israel and what the future can be for all of us. And Mitsuya, Mitsuya. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed by Yishai Fleischer. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. And if you want to be in touch with Yishai Fleischer yourself, you email me and I will forward your emails on to him. And remember, there's now a L'Chaim podcast. So if you miss any L'chaim program or you want to hear programs from the past, go to iTunes or Google Play or wherever you listen to your podcast and listen to L'chaim. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.